Hello and welcome to a Think Peace podcast with your host Aaron. Today we will be going into my second Think Peace. Starting with the shorthand. Arriving to our second official release of our newsletter, Think Peace. This week we are covering some interesting topics, ranging from the game of chess in the South China Sea, the rise of mega corporations, and where in the world is most of the bourbon made? Like all great pieces, this one will certainly make you think, or at the very least, thirsty. Which, considering how this last piece went, it was actually pretty solid. And now that I think about it, you know, I do have a hankering for bourbon, which is really, really one of my favorite topics to always talk about. So, fortunately for you all, I do go into quite a great detail on that subject itself. But needless to say, moving on to the section called the market, this is where I enjoy diving into stock markets and other forms of uh, economic transactions and just, you know, regular business. The stuff that's like Wall Street and all that fun stuff that most everyone just really, you know, doesn't really care about, doesn't really understand and just kind of is like, oh, well, I know a guy who handles stocks. I know a guy who does bonds. I know a guy who does the stock market, who's on Wall Street. You know, that usual stuff. I like to dibble dabble in it a little bit. And so in this section, I did actually just do that. And I picked five companies that I was particularly interested in and just looked at. And, you know, usually I just like to track, engage, and kind of kind of compete myself to see, you know, where will I, you know, where my speculations may to lead me or if I was guessing right or if I've studied them correctly or just in general. It's kind of like a game. And so I treat it as such. So none of these are suggestions, are um, recommendations, are intents, or very, uh, what would you consider? Um, They're not recommendations for any sale or security or anything that's of any of that nature. These are just things that I enjoy, I like to look at, and I have favorites that I just, you know, it's fun, it's a game, and I enjoy doing it. And you know, if I'm, you know, whatever happens, it's no, I, I can't, uh, I'm not recommending anything. And it's just something I do for fun and it's not a research, not a study or anything like that. But I'm just putting my opinion out there and uh, I enjoy these guys and uh, I like the stocks. I like to play the game. It's just a game to me. So moving with that, this is where I look at the stocks and I have them, I have their stock indicators or their tickers, the name of the company, their weak valuation, and the price of their stocks. So we will begin with the first company that uh, I always have a tendency to look at. They're considered a penny stock. And a penny stock is just where a stock really doesn't deviate high from, you know, say the stock is 50 cents a share up to two or three dollars. Sometimes it goes as high as five dollars, but they're considered penny stocks. Because anyone can buy them, and you can lose, make money, you you know, it's not, you know, you throw $10 at it, and, you know, you you lose $10, it's not a big loss, you know, sometimes you may gain $20, it's all in, you know, it's again a dice roll sometimes, so this stock specifically is considered a penny stock, it is the Nova Bay Pharmaceuticals, with their little trigger, um, excuse me, not trigger, but ticker, NBY, and that week, which was the end of two, the week that ended on a Tuesday before I published this, it was down nine cents, making it a total share of 91 cents. Well, considering that I, this is the past and looking at it today, literally kid you not, today, it, ro- it went from between then, which was at the time of this writing, I believe it was in August, all the way up to now. It had rose all the way up to, I think it was a dollar sixty three, sixty four, And then now it's today, as I was looking at it, it was at uh, 95 cents. So looking at it from this perspective, it, it's gone. It's gone up and down, up and down. But the markets today were very hostile to anything. So... With that being said, uh, I always just stuck with this guy. I always enjoyed the pharmaceutical industries, but it was a cheap stock, you know? And I've always bought in it and sold in it and just, it's cheap. And it's just fun to gauge and test out your skills and not really, you know, 
uh, it's fun to play one of the little slots. You know, go in there, put in a dollar, put in 50 cents, and see if you win anything. If you don't, you don't. If you do, hey, you won something, right? That's exactly what this stock was about. So moving to the next one, which is actually... This one was more research, and I had a hunch, and it was just something I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test this theory out, right? So it was AP Moeller, which is Maersk, or Maersk, which is, uh, I could be saying it wrong, mind you, it's M-A-E-R-S-K, with the ticker A-M-K-B-Y. Now, this is a Dutch company, no, excuse me, Danish company, Yes, and it is a cargo container company. It builds sh and maintains uh, containers, shipping containers that go on ships. So in, I believe it was in March last year when, you know, the pandemic was just about to go, you know, hey, guess what? We're, we're you know, hold my beer moment. And I was overseas in Southeast Asia already experiencing it quite intensely. So I seen this and I was like, hey, you know, I got a, I got an idea, you know, I'm thinking of something, right? So I got into it and I it was like, I've always seen it everywhere, right? You see these trucks and ships and you always see that big, you know, the M-A-E-R-S-K in blue letters, usually on a gray container, right? I always see it everywhere. Sometimes it's black, but you know, I see them everywhere. Everyone knows them just about. I feel I do anyway. But that's just me. Maybe I'm a weirdo that looks at transportation and all that jazz and shipping. Anyway, I see him on the road, see him everywhere. And I was like, hey, I remember that shipping co company. And I was like, huh, what, are they only like a dollar or something? Yeah, they were like literally, you think it was like two or three dollars at the time. And I was like, I'll just buy a couple of those, you know, because I've seen them everywhere. And, you know, I got a feeling, you know, I, I literally did. I had a feeling that this pandemic stuff was going to was gonna make some other stuff a little bit more complicated. Needless to say, with that minimalist of research and understanding of the situation, which later turned out to be, you know, I looked into it more and I was like, oh, snap. Literally, literally, the valuation of that week on this uh, particular stock was, it was losing 25 cents, about 24 cents, but, you know, give or take. And its value was $7.48. I was looking at it the other day, and it hit up to the $10 uh, share valuation. I mean, it had it had exploded, and it was just, it's not so much surprising as like, huh, it makes sense. Because uh, I started looking this up and researching it, and it's actually going to be one of my uh, pieces later on this year that I specifically look into the subject of shipping and uh, supply lanes and containers and such. And it was a significant um, issue with supply and demand on containers alone. And then shipping alone was an issue because of the pandemic and the limitations on who could bring what in and how, you know, the whole process. We had shipping container ships, these ships just sitting out in the harbors, you know, going months at a time without being unloaded. And then, you know, trade conflicts and stuff. There was so many things that I didn't know at the time that I was like, oh, I'm going to jump in on this because I like this. I've seen this company everywhere. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be one of my bigger stories later on, which is, ha, ha, hit, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, go uh, subscribe and read it. It's going to be, um, it would explode, and it did. And it was quite surprising. I wasn't expecting it. But, yeah, it's just a shipping container company. So moving on to the next stock was Ambev with the ticker ABEV. Now, Ambev, if um, many don't know, it is a Scandinavian? I am very speculative on it, so don't hold me accountable to it. Um, it's a Scandinavian company, I think, or Holland. So... It's a Dutch, potentially. Anyway, what had happened and reason why I thought about these guys and actually own any of them is because they bought into Anheuser Busch, which was a huge beer, and the whole con, the whole, and this was a couple of years ago, and it was a huge thing. Everybody's like, "Oh goodness, oh goodness, this Missouri, I think it was Missouri, this Missouri uh, beer company, the oldest in America, one of the most trademarks, one of the, you know, the big Clydesdale, but you know, the big old commercial Super Bowl, you know, everybody knows the." Red Can, Budweiser, you know, Bud Light and all them beers, they bought them out. And so they become Enbev. And so I was like, well, you know, why not? I'll buy into it because I like beer and, you know, 
how much worse could you get with a beer than Budweiser? I mean, really. But, so yeah, no, I tracked them, and their valuation at this time of this week was they were losing $0.09, cents, but their stock value was $2.32. So, obviously, you know, I'm hitting more down in the penny margins, you know, the penny stocks, but needless to say, it's, I, it hasn't done too hot. Considering the pandemic was a real time when, if you were a brewer, there was 50-50 chance that if you could, the problem they had was getting the beers to the hands of people. Now, if they went to the grocers, you know, grocery stores and such, it was much easier to market and sell beers because people were, you know, you're sitting at home, what are you going to do? You're going to drink more. But that also led to the liqueurs and the malts and stuff like that that would rise in sales for them. Because, you know, why would you, I mean, yeah, drinking beer is nice and all, but you're going to get that beer gut, you're going to feel bubbly, you're just going to, you're not going to feel pleasant drinking it necessarily. And, you know, you're going to be, you know, if you drink Bud Light, I mean, are you really drinking a beer? I mean, you're getting alcohol, but if you're going to do that, just grab a bourbon or a tequila or make you a, you know, vodka Orange juice, a, str- a screwdriver. I mean, there's many other ways to get your alcoholic kick than uh, one of those types of a Budweiser or any of the mainstay beers that we now have that are just... Okay, I'm coming from a beer connoisseur's take, and I just can't, you know, I, you know, if that's what you can afford, then Natty Natty Light will work, okay? Or PBR will work, okay? I mean, they're not the best at all, but I mean, if you're gonna, you're gonna be drinking, I mean, watered down beer or very lack of any taste beer because you want to get the alcohol kick... Hit a Keystone, hit a Natty Light, or hit a PBR because, I mean, just be true to form, you know? Don't act like a Budweiser or Bud Light or those guys or Michelob Ultra or any of those. Yes, I'll say it like that. Yeah, any of those guys or anything other than just not, you know, they're just not beer. They're not beer. It's not. I mean, yes, they go through the same process You're using yeast, fermentation. They, you know, have beer characteristics. But, I mean, it's literally just there's literally no flavor. There's just nothing to the beer itself. It just makes you got to use a, uh, the bathroom more often. For what? You're going to get drunk? That's it, man. Come on. Get a real reason, man. At least Natty Light is not going to act like it's we're the best beer in the world. It's like uh, Keystone, I'm not the best beer in the world. And Paps Blue Ribbon. It's just a tried and true garbage beer. So, I mean, if you're looking for a cheap alternative to drinking, there you go. Those three guys, will they'll get your fix, and they won't act like they're something that they're not. And anyway, I got on a tangent there. I apologize. But Ambev, uh, they bought into Budweiser, and they own many other uh, beverages and uh, many other um, breweries. Or not brewery, excuse me, but yeah, actually they do. They technically own many other craft brewers. Like I believe one is, uh, um, ah, it escapes me now. But they own many other craft brewers, and so they own all the more of the bigger ones as well. So they've been taking some hits lately that I know of. But that's uh, again, people can't go out. They can't go to the pub. They can't go to the bar. They can't buy a beer. Can't go hang out with friends. And usually, nine times out of ten, beer is a socializing sort of beverage. You know, you go out. You want to have a casual beer. You know, you want to hang out with friends, something to sip on, or you know, watch the game with, have a beer. You know, or have it or a pair. If you're, you know, connoisseur, you're gonna craft. You're gonna go for a craft beer over any of these tri- traditional beers. Like these beers are like what you will find at your sports bar your local dive bars they're cheap they're there but i mean then again if you're hitting cheap and there you're nine times gonna get ten nine times out of ten gonna find a paps blue ribbon anywhere because i mean you can get a 16 ounce one of those for like two dollars it's like i mean yeah really i mean and you're talking like places in philadelphia and new york that you can find it maybe three dollars so why would you pay like five or six dollars for a budweiser when you can get that see it's just you know it's all in the person you're selling to, and most of the time when you hear Bud Weiser or the Bud Light, you're going to be, it's really region oriented and very certain demographic that really knows those beers, so, you know, if those guys are not buying them, it's kind of hurting, so the company hasn't been doing too hot, but some of their other products have been, so needless to say, I bought into them because I always thought they were interesting, and that was their scorecard for that week. Moving on... We're going to go to a 
more southern based uh, grocer, which is named Kroger. Their ticker is KR. And at the time of this week, that week, it had lost 26 cents. But this one's more of a pricier one, but an older company. You know, the companies that are tried and true. It's an American company, and it's been around since 1930s. So it's one of those older, like, if you're thinking, like, old traditional companies, it's like a hit, you know, think of Ford, you think of uh, uh, any of the car dealerships that are older, like Chevrolet, and some of those kind of companies that are tried and true. Kroger is a tried and true company. So when you're buying into those guys, you're, you're going to be staying in it long term. You're not looking for the explosive tech stuff, you know. Oh, one day it's like $26 a share and all of a sudden now it's $250 or it's like, you know, Amazon starting at like $56 and now $2,000 a share. Now, no, you're, <laughs> these companies are not. These are the ones, you know, you buy, you're steady, slow, they have dividend yields that are okay, but you want your... You want to have modest returns. You want to have security. It's very low risk companies, but they were at this time losing, like I said, 26 cents, and they were get their share was 36 dollars and eight cents, which recently they've been doing a little bit better, but a lot of negative news has been hitting them that I had seen. Um, news regarding like wages and what they were going to do with staff which is never never that's a pr nightmare necessarily especially in the pandemic they were you know they were one of the first ones to jump on the uh, mobile apps you know and i was all about that i mean i always shop at kroger and that's the reason why i bought into them i shop at kroger and so it's it's easier to track if it's something you're familiar with. So that was always my basis for buying companies. If I'm familiar with them and I see them every day, then, you know, generally you can gauge like, you know, you can gauge the health of a company, not just by its spreadsheets, but by their business themselves. You know, like I don't know about many of my listeners if they've ever been to Kmart. And I don't know if you remember seeing how Kmart, when it was going downhill and closing many of their stores, their stores were just ransacked. They were just left. They just had stuff everywhere. No one cared. Products were just slung everywhere. I mean, it was it looked exactly like the story of them going bankrupt and closing their stores. And it looked exactly like that. So, you know, same for Blockbuster and those guys. But Kroger, like I said, you know, like all their stores, they are they adapted to the pandemic. And I think they their, their stratagem is pretty, pretty solid, except, like I said, for their PR issues with, you know, wages. They're, you know, they're had a given emergency hero wages and then they're like oh hey we need those back that's kind of like jerk i mean when you're you know yeah as an investor you got to be a conscious understander uh you gotta, you gotta consciously understand excuse me that what you're buying into you're supporting them right so you're supporting their actions so it's a very big conflict of interest and it really depends on like what kind of finances you're looking into, like uh, what your game, like your game plan is for overall, and it's just a lot more to it than that. But I, I owned them a while back, years ago, and so I just stuck with them at this point because it's not a, you know, it's not a gamble. It's not really. I've gained a little bit in it, and you know they give dividends, so there's that. I mean, you know, morally objective to several of their actions recently, but I mean, am I in this for you know? I mean, it's a conflict of interest. Am I conscious? Am I a conscious investor or am I a profitable investor? That has always been a moral dilemma that I've had to counter myself with constantly when doing stocks. So when you get into this, don't, I mean, like I said, make a solid plan, know what you're doing, consciously understand what not only your, your risk threshold is, but what is your moral and conscious threshold when dealing with this? I mean... You know, you have to ask you if you're not asking yourself these sort of questions, then you really don't need to be in this industry. I don't I don't believe so. Anyway, I mean, some people will disagree, which is fine. We all have opinions, but they don't matter really in my scheme of things. But <laughs> again, that's an opinion, supposedly. So moving on from that one, we're going, like I said, literally, literally talked about this company just a minute ago in the traditional companies, the tried and trues. Ford Motor Company, obviously, with a ticker of F, it's literally at this period, it was gaining six cents and its share was $6.95. If anyone knows anything about the, re well, not recent, but it's, it's, 
goodness, thinking about it now, 2008, the financial crisis, and you had these big bubbles of auto industries that had bellied up. Ford was one of those companies, and they were looking like they were restructuring, they were, you know, doing different things, and so they had government bailouts and whatnot, so I got into them then, a while back, so this is an old one, and I, I mean, I'm an American in that sense that I know Ford. Ford is not, you know, it's, it's a traditional, like, 1900s, it's an old company, it's tried and true, I mean... Again, they showed that they could belly up, and they very well could have just given out. But, I mean, it's a government literally came in and bailed them out. And now they, at the time, they were restructuring themselves, and they've done a little better. But, I mean, overall, uh, I mean, they're just, they're in a uh, industry that is quickly outpacing them. And for everything that they have gained over these centuries, that they, a century that they've been around, They've not been on the, what would you consider, the competitive edge in the sense of innovation or keeping up with the trends or adapting to what is relevant and current or adjusting their market to focus on the growing um, demographics that are going to be coming up, the generations that will be purchasing their vehicles. And so they've been slow to take on that with, you know, the Ford's traditional F-150 is their mainstay product, one of their mainstay products. Everyone knows it. It's one of the highlights of their, ve their you know, their auto industry. Needless to say, you know, people are not the trend is people are not buying trucks as much, you know, not in the same capacity as, you know, needing that big of a vehicle. You know, lately I've been seeing like SUV trend has been popping up. And so like even like the Ford Fiesta, Ford Focus, these vehicles have been like, you know, slowly being pulled back for more SUV or sub SUV friendlier vehicles like, you know, the Explorer and stuff. So, I mean, the truck, the F-150 still in its, you know, it's still a big old, uh, I guess you could, for lack of a better term, a cash puppy for them. But at the same time, it's like, you know, if they can push more of the EV, the EV cars, like the hybrids and the more environmentally friendly stuff, they're going to be targeting a different, a different generation. And then, you know, their whole, their, their sheer manufacturing capacity, their ability to, like, they're, they're, they were scaled for handling millions and millions of cars being produced. So, you know, it is really, it's really hard to use, just completely change the entire manufacturing block, you know, change the entire logistics of everything and everything. But I believe they can possibly do that. And I've stuck with them this long. It's kind of like, like I said, tried and true. They have a dividend share they give out, and they're just a traditional company. It's like, you know, I own a few of them, and it's just like, I might as well stick with them at this point now. So, with that said, that was my top five of that week of my shares. So, I literally use several platforms. Currently, I've been using Robinhood, which has had has faced some heat Quite a bit of heat and several lawsuits, easily 50 or more lawsuits on the recent action on the uh, GameStop stock debacle that they had. And so normally I, I always recommend them because I have a referral co code that helps you and me both get it. But, you know, I use them sometimes because they're true. Their app is more uh, mobile friendly, so it's very intuitive for people that are just using it or just getting into the markets and stuff. But at the same time, it's kind of like, well, you know, their actions really make them really, you know, not user friendly. You know, they're very hostile to their consumer base. So needless to say, um, I usually use them, but I have and do use E-Trade. I do use Fidelity. I also use Charles Schwab. Um, and these are my mainstay platforms that I use for any of my investments. And each one has significant benefits for using whatever uh, investment vehicle you want. Investment vehicle being like a IRA or a, a uh, 401k retirement fund, simple stocks, handling bonds, uh, mutual funds, uh, ETFs, those sort of things. And so each one has their, you know, particular best, their, their strengths. So whenever you're looking at platforms, I highly recommend you, again, this is where 
understanding your purchasing, all these risk values, and what your game is game plan is, and what you want to gain is the biggest thing you need to solve before you ever jump into these. So I highly recommend you do that. But those are the platforms I use. So with that being said, that was my the market section. Moving on. So now we enter the section called the numbers game where I focus on articles that are related to specific numbers and their valuations and explain what their whole meaning and point is. Our first story begins at $26.5 trillion. Which is a staggering sum, but at the time of this newsletter, August 26, the United States debt with the pandemic had ballooned it got it was pushed up to 136 percent of the u.s gdp which is the united states gross domestic product which is literally their income so imagine a life where your credit being 100 percent of your annual income that's where the united states currently stands plus you add an extra 36 percent now, with the upcoming hurricane season, the wildfires in California, and the new calls for stimulus rounds for a floundering economy, expect that number to only grow, which, in truth, yes. This is a circumstance where, imagine if you you are making around, what, I don't know, the average income for an American hits around fifty to $60,000 a year, right? Imagine you have a debt which is usually what happens with your house and stuff so all of a sudden you know you have over you buy a house that's around half a million dollars which is five hundred thousand dollars that means you're going to be trying to make these crazy payments every month to get that price down but you're going to be owing for several years so imagine you know because you can only pay a portion that fifty thousand dollars a year is not all going to go on your house debt it's a chunk of what you're living off of you still got to pay other bills so then all of a sudden you got maybe what potentially you can spare a thousand dollars a month to pay on something like that a house but then all of a sudden you have a five hundred thousand dollar bill to cover it's impossible you just can't really you can't do it it's quadruple if not just over the debt threshold that you can uh, maintain and handle with that said the united states is in that position but as a sovereign nation it is different and i say that very reluctantly because yes debt is a bad thing but a nation can handle debt in certain ways and in this case if your creditors are confident in your abilities to maintain or pay back or that the interest rates are really good or you're a safe bet of course they're going to keep investing you and of course you're going to be able to draw more wealth from that and use your debt and many people will be like hey how, how does the united states get uh all these loans who gives it to them china it's china ain't it it's like well yes and no they usually just issue bonds which is debt sovereign debt and then people like you and me and then other nationalities or other countries or also corporations can buy into these debts which is a guarantee that the united states of america will pay that debt back with the purchase of that bond so you're buying to own the debt of the united states of america on these bonds and the longer you keep the bond the more interest they'll pay you for owning it which is literally the interest that the united states pays on borrowing money thus that is how a nation borrows money they don't go to a lender they don't go to any of any organizations or something and says hey can i have a loan for 100 million 100 billion dollars no they literally issue bonds sovereign debt and that's how they can balloon their debt ratio thus that's how they can continuously borrow it's the moment that they issue the bonds and no one buys in them or investors are like no no this ain't a, this is scrap this is garbage so you don't we, we don't want to buy into it that's when the governments can't get loans anymore or can't get financing and thus that is the difference between sovereign debt and say debt that you and i would own or a corporation would have now going on to the next one is two trillion dollars we're still in the trillions folks it's an astronomical number at this point apple the company the first publicly traded u.s company 
to reach that valuation. That means the company of Apple literally just got or accumulated and became with assets and all to worth two trillion dollars. At the time, Apple was facing legal actions with specifically EB or Epic Games over its app rule store rules. And the this app, like honestly, like with most Apple things, they tend to be really, really hostile to anything that isn't Apple. So in this case, it's they take 30% of all transactions in their through any apps through their stores. And then at this time, which I did participate a little bit in the Apple stock would split four to one, which means they would break the stock originally from one stock. They would divide it up into four more stocks. So if you own one Apple share, you now own four Apple shares, but it would cut the price in half by four or not in half. Excuse me. It cut it by four. So if the stock was $400 for one share, now it was $100 for one share. So it uh, allowed more people to invest into it, but also if you already own shares in it, it diluted your value in it. Needless to say, that only benefited Apple and it has tremendously helped them weatherfall the whole pandemic and just expand their treasury or their war chest as a business. And thus, them hitting two trillion was pretty much inevitable at that point. Now, to our next set of numbers. Four regions. These regions are more specifically oceans, or seas as you would call them. Verse 1 starts with the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Yellow Sea, and the Bohai Gulf, which is technically a sea. The Chinese People's Liberation Army Navy, which is PLA's Navy, which, yeah, exactly, they held at this time in this particular these particular regions military exercises roughly at the same time which is a they were demonstrating their military capabilities to handle simultaneous actions or attacks on all four of these seas and oceans at the same time this was pretty much a um Simply a show of arms, a demonstration that they were capable of responding in this manner at any given point, at any given time. This also was, this response was done in due part because of the, at the time, the increased presence of the U.S. and, uh, the U.S. Navy and Taiwan's increasing in, uh, stance on independence. China, at this time of me writing this, and they still, as of now, only have two aircraft carriers. But they have several, about around four to five, in development. And the biggest thing, though, they boast a lot of cruisers, destroyers, frigates, and they have a specific type of ship designated as a carrier destroyer type of ship. Which is designed to level out the playing field of the Chinese Navy to the... American Navy. Now, this is where it all for me begins is China diplomatically has been increasing their efforts to coerce, coerce and rally Southeast Asian nations under their banner to deprive the United States of any potential allies in the region, which was in uh, geopolitical situations. It is a smart move on the Chinese part to do something like this. So they're not surrounded by hostile nations or you know, nations that just really, you know, don't care one way or another in their concept of, uh, this is actually a term, uh, string of pearls, which is their efforts to build a buffer or a form of, de not a deterrence, but a sort of seawall to protect mainland China from any hostile invasions of foreigners invading their country, which... China does have a history of the uh, 19th century year century of humiliation where foreign well European colonizers invaded China repeatedly and colonized portions of it and forced China into several several uh, humiliating uh, treaties which left obviously it really did leave a bad taste in the Chinese mouth and thus Japan also jumped in on that so there is some historical reckoning to be taken considered with uh, their actions now 
And you really can't blame the Chinese for wanting to protect themselves, expand their sovereignty, and, you know, uh, create a buffer between them and their potential adversaries. But at the same time, you have to look at it as, you know, China hasn't been just this weak, helpless nation anymore like it had, like it had been in the past. It has developed and thrived under the current global system that has enabled it to prosper beyond anyone's wildest imaginations and china has been just extremely you know they've been benefit they've been benefiting it extremely well and they can still but it's the challenge of uh the upcomer challenging the hegemon of the region, which is certainly is uh, the United States. And they're wanting to, I would say, not so much cause an upheaval or completely disrupt or destroy the order. But they will certainly, they, they, at first I thought they wanted to be equal players, you know, I benefit, I believed in, you know, oh, they want to be equals and stuff, but how you, how they brazenly treat other nations and how they do things and, you know, the slightest missay or slightest, you know, oh, hey, you know, your government's leader is kind of, eh, he's just not pleasant, and then they slap you with, insults and then they slap you with tariffs and then they say we're not buying your stuff anymore it's kind of like ah, okay okay come on i mean you could be real thin skin and all but i mean that's just you you know that's just not this is not cool your soft power your influence that's just not good so it's kind of it's an ebb and flow now you know neither one of the u.s or china are in a particular position to be considered the better option of the other i mean it depends so you start dissecting both and you can find pros and cons of either or but at the same time it's like what's actually happening is, is what is actually happening in this is a race of arms between the two powers and who can beat the other and so that's the calamity. It's it's the revisiting of the old Cold War stance where you have the superpower of the Soviet Union against the superpower of the United States, which in this case, China is a rising power, though, and the U.S. is the aged one that's holding on to its position precariously, and thus you get a lucidities trap where the usurper is coming to challenge and seize the mantle of the hegemon and the most powerful one who can make the rules in the region. And so it always inevitably leads to war. And that is the calamity that I personally want to avoid. And I do believe others want to, but it's really hard to see others, some others, deterring it. But regardless, that was the section called the numbers game. Next we'll be covering a section called out of the loop which just covers certain projects and certain events that are interesting to me, but they don't really pertain to very much of the corresponding world, how would you say? They're kind of side notes, interesting tidbits that, you know, I like to share and talk about. Anyway, first, maps and their power. For me, I've always had a love affair with maps. They've always been something extremely interesting. When I was a boy, you know, I had ambitious dreams and hopes for a future, I would draw tons of maps. It is something that I've always just found interesting, and I've just enjoyed playing with them. You know, I drew all sorts of maps when I was a kid, from fictitious worlds to real ones. And I actually stumbled at this time across a article that was a 3D rendering a map of global population density which is really interesting in the sense of getting a co getting a comprehensive understanding of the population densities of everywhere like specifically china u.s india and the southeast asian area which you know what this maps what excuse me what these maps really pertain to is the population density in specific areas. So let's say you look at New York and in this map you show the population density per square foot, which is pretty freaking crazy. It is some of the most highly populated areas 
in the world, and New York is one of them, and so is Los Angeles in a square footage. How many people live in a square foot, just about? And China is right up there. I mean, it is up there. It is one of the most highly dense countries in the world. Then you have India, same way. And then you have a lot of Southeast Asian countries that have cities like Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh City, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, those areas that are just literally just high density, highly populated areas in a small cramped area. But this map covers a lot of them, and it's actually really cool to see the numbers and see it in a graph and have a visual representation of this sort of statistic, which I just found interesting, so I had the link. So I'll provide it in down below. Next, uh, one of my other favorite technologies and concepts is 3D printing. And so this was a really interesting study that I had found. A group had designed a 3D printing method and machine that uses soil as a building material for homes and buildings. So instead of using, say, like a plastic or a highly... Most, most of these plastics in 3D printing is, are not toxic or harmful to consume or anything, but these are like biodegradable substances. Like you could use like the earth, wood, and stuff but you can make them 3D printed. Instead of needing like a log or a board or a plywood and stuff, have to hammer nail, this is a 3D printing. This 3D printing machine allows you to expedite the building process where you're not having to have continuously a large amounts of people to facilitate the building of a building and whatnot. You instead have a machine that is constructing each individual layer of the building in a rapid procession and raising a building out of nothing in such a short amount of time compared to what used to be able, which would allow the process of building houses more affordable to more levels of people, which would in that turn bring down the ability, the, bring down the walls that keep people from being able to both purchase land and also afford to build houses. And with this technology, you could literally move it anywhere in the world and you would not be limited to what materials were available or also the labor pool that was there. You could literally just put these manufactured houses into situations that are uh, less favorable to generally just building at all. Say a natural disaster or something, boom, guess what? You can build a house there and make it temporary, just like trailers, but instead you can make it a permanent house. But you can also bring in the material that you can't get in otherwise. So the process is potentially revolutionize the way humans interact with the world around them. I mean, it's... When I seen it and read the article itself specifically, I was like, oh man, this is really rad. I mean, this is really cool. I would totally be all about it. I live in a 3D printed house if I had the chance. And then next we had Rise of the Machines, as I called it. It's literally a simulated dogfight competition where an artificial intelligence or an AI algorithm was implanted or put into an F-16 and it waged a dogfight, obviously, which is a fight between two jets or two planes, and it fought against a human. And, well, <laughs> let's just say it, well, the AI beat the human five times straight. And it's pretty, pretty promising for an artificial intelligence to be able to beat a human at its own game in any capacity. Either it be Go, or it's chess, or checkers, or anything really. But in a simulated combat scenario where you have a weapon of massive capabilities and extreme destruction going head-to-head -head against the human with a computer at its helm, it's kind of scary if you think about it. That means we'll have created the capacity to destroy ourselves, not only with our own weapons of mass destruction and devices, but also create artificial intelligence that is capable of doing the same to us. And at some point, they may create or enhance their abilities to be 
thinking, developing thought, and then say, hey, humans don't deserve to live, or some stuff like that. Just like in literally The Matrix, or even like Terminator, and all that stuff. Do you know? The Hollywood stuff. So this, this is where it becomes like, ooh, that's frightfully close to those movie settings. And I mean, what kind of potential does that lead to, you know? I mean... I mean, it's a great idea to think we're going to have, all of us will have, like, artificial intelligence and AIs fighting, you know, dying and killing each other in the air and stuff without humans losing their lives. But at the same time, what other potentialities have we, uh, you know, expanded on? And what kind of Pandora boxes have we just begun to open? And so I really was like, thinking about that when I seen this article and I think the article is pretty good so I recommend anybody that has an interest in any of those fields to take a gander at it but all right so that was the section um out of the loop and it's just this little quirky thing involving technologies and things that are interesting to me and uh, I will have those down in the description for you to uh, go check out those articles and with that, this concludes my second podcast of Think Piece, number two. So I hope you've enjoyed and possibly learned something. As always, I will inject um, the links and all the other articles that I mentioned in this podcast down below in the descriptions. And if you haven't already, I hope you will follow me and subscribe. And in the future, if you give a chance, give me a like or give me a shout or even just share me around. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the next installation of the Think Peace podcast.